Did you know that one in five children in Sweden are sexually abused? One in five children. It's quite many, right? And they don't talk about it. They're silenced. They're forced to be silenced. And they're taught to think that everything is my fault. If you say something, I will kill your mother. I will kill your sister. So they hold the silence forever. And I think one of the reasons I became a communication consultant was because I decided when I was a child that once I decide to break the silence, I will do it really well. So that's the reason I'm a communication consultant. And this is actually the first time I tell anybody that that's the reason. Most people know me as Elaine, communication consultant, but not as one in five. So this is, my, uh, this is me when I was seven years old in, in, in the first class. And um, you see children smiling in the photo, but what you don't see is the statistics in Sweden. Uh, if you count on it, on average, three in each class has been sexually abused. So when I watch my picture, I just want to figure out who are the other two, and I want to jump in the picture and save those children. I want you to take a moment and think about your class. Which one were they? Three in each class. When we talk about one in five, statistics are just numbers. It doesn't really make us feel stuff, does it? But when we see people, flesh, something happens. I've asked one in five people in here. They don't have this experience, but I, I want them to become the statistics. So one in five, could you please stand up in here? So what you see now is representing the statistics. One in five people. So every day, every one in five person you meet has been sexually abused. So we go from numbers to flesh. Thank you. You may be seated. Quite many just in this room, right? So what I want to talk about today is four ways to make people lack the experience that I have today. In the future, I want one in five to become zero. I don't want anybody having to say, me too. So I'm, what I want to do is bring hope, basically. So this topic is this, it's a heavy topic. So the first thing we need to do in order to make people be saved from sexual abuse is to break the silence. Um, pedophiles enjoy silence. They want you to be silent because silence is their best friend. So if you've been sexually abused as a child, you need to break that silence because then you stop holding the hand of the pedophile's best friend. Break the silence. And when I think about breaking the silence, there are some role models that we can look to. I don't know if you know about the gay activist Harvey Milk. Some of you know him. He was very active in the 70s. He's not with us anymore. But he was such an inspiring uh, communicator. Um, he would argument against priests uh, in Christianity using the Bible as arguments. When they would say homosexual people would go to hell, Harvey Milk would use the Bible to say, love thy neighbor and love thy enemy. So he was a genius when it came to communication. But what, stri what strikes me the most is the fact that he encouraged each and every gay person to come out of the closet. Because at that time, people considered gay people to be strange, somebody out there. So what I'm going to ask you now to read with me his quote. He said, gay brothers and sisters, you must come out. Come out to your parents, come out to your relatives, come out to your friends. If indeed they are your friends. Come out to your neighbors, to your fellow workers, to the people who work where you eat and shop. Come out only to the people you know and who know you. Not to anyone else, but once and for all, break down the myths. Destroy the lies and distortions for your sake, for their sake, for the sake of the youngsters. And also, he said, burst down those closet doors once and for all and stand up and start to fight. So what do I want to tell you? What can we be taught from Harvey Milk is 
if you're a survivor of sexual abuse, I'm not saying come out of the closet. It's not a closet, but come out of the shame. The shame is not yours. It's supposed to be the pedophile's. So once you break the silence, something magical happens. <clears throat> Tell people that I was sexually abused when I was a kid, and this was the person who sexually abused me. What you will notice is that shame will come out of you because it's not yours anymore, and you will feel a lot freer as a person. And when you tell people that you're a survivor of sexual abuse as a child, you transform statistic to flesh and blood. They will see that's nothing that happens out there. I know somebody who's been sexually abused. One in five standing straight in front of me. I don't know if you noticed uh, the fire escapes in this room. Do you know where to go if there's a fire? Yep. And also, do you know how a fire exit looks like? You do, right? Because we have that in Sweden. That's mandatory to teach kids and uh, grown-ups, everybody, uh, the fire drills. So in Sweden, roughly, we're 10 million citizens. So now we're going into statistics and uh, numbers. Not my favorite topic, but I like these numbers. And did you know that 100 people dies in fire accidents each year? 100 people out of 10 million people die each year in fire accidents. So that's 0. 0.00001 of the population. Okay. So by law, each school have two fire drills per year, okay? So if you look at the logics, if 100 people die each year and you have two fire drills per year, that means that we take 2% out of those who suffer from fire accidents, okay? So 2% out of 100 people. Let's go to the amount of people who's been sexually abused in Sweden, so with 10 million citizens still in Sweden, we have 1 million children, roughly. One out of five gets sexually abused. That's 200,000 get sexually abused. But we don't really know if it is, if it is uh, every year. Uh, in my case, I'm one of five. Uh, I got sexually abused from the age of two till I was 10 years old. So that's eight years in a row. So the statistics can be slowly. And logics, if 200,000 sufferers from sexual abuse, 2% would be 4,000 practices per year. So if we were to have integrity drills that I would tell you each day in school, well, 4,000 per year, that's quite a lot, isn't it? But that's only 2% out of those who suffer from uh, sexual abuse. Do we need integrity drills. I'm convinced that we do. We need to teach children what's right and wrong when it comes to our integrity, our private parts, and so on. Do we need fire drills? Absolutely. I think that because of the fire drills that we have each year, just two each year, that's the reason why the percentage is so low. So what I want to do, my mis mission in my life is to push the percentage in Sweden when it comes to sexual abuse to point, 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 no, you know what? Zero. That would be a good number. No single child with the experience that I have. So how many mandatory integrity drills do we have per year in Sweden? Do you know? 2% would be 4,000. How many of you know where the fire escape is in here? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you know what to do if you've been sexually abused? Well, I can tell you. Call the police. So if grown-ups don't know, how will the children know? So what I want you to do right now is turn to your neighbor and guess the amount of uh, integrity drills we have in Sweden. Do we have a specific time during school where a teacher teach us about integrity and private parts and so on? Turn to your neighbor and guess the number. Okay. The answer to your question is 
none. Can you imagine? So that's one thing. I'm positive if somebody would have told me, Elaine, you know what? There's a few private parts that you have that nobody's allowed to touch. And I'm going to teach you which one there are. And I'm not allowed to touch you while I teach you. Then I would have understood. One of the most common things that survivors of sexual abuse feel is shame. Uh, I remember telling uh, one of my friends that I feel such a huge shame when I think about the sexual abuse that I was a victim of. And she said, why are you ashamed? And I said, because I didn't say no. Why didn't I say no? And she said, because you were a child. You didn't know better. So it's not your fault. So now I said two things that we need to do. Um, so I really, really want the integrity drills. That would have been great. And also break the silence. Tell people that you've been abused. And the third thing is I want us to talk talk integrity to our children. This is my oldest one, Matteo. He's six years old. And did you know that the average age when children are exposed to uh, pornography is eight? When they're eight, year, eight years old. I'm like stuttering talking about this because it's so emotional because when I was exposed to porn, I wasn't eight, I was two. My father groomed me. When I'm standing here, this, um, it feels like the sofa I was sitting on in his apartment. It wasn't red, it was brown. And I was two years old, and he sat me there, and all I did was watching porn, because he wanted me to feel that this is normal. This is what people do. He would define it as love. He would take me to streets where people would sell sex, and he would say, they're selling love. So that's grooming. He tried to make it normal. One of the most disgusting things he told me was, Elaine, you're such a grown-up for your age. <sighs> Disgusting. I can't even stand hearing that. You're such a grown-up for your age. I can tell you anything. So having three children, one of my mission are to never having to experience them telling me, Mom, I've been sexually abused. That's not going to happen. So when you get exposed for pornography when you're eight-year-olds, what you need to do if you have a child, you need to talk to them about the situation. When, when Matteo was two years old and we potty trained him, I told him about his private parts. And I told him, now you get to dry yourself. This is your private part. So is your mouth. And, uh, so nobody, and, your, and your butt. Nobody's allowed to touch them. And he was like, not even you and, and dad? And I'm like, no, we're not allowed. We can help you if you need help, but that's your part. Can I touch them? <laughs> like, yes, you can, but when you're alone and in a private space, and I suggest that would be your room. But he could sit in the kitchen. He's like, private space. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. And also, I taught him to say, stop my body. And that's really important. So whenever somebody touches him in a way he doesn't like, he's supposed to say, stop my body. Only when we're to uh, toothbrush him, he would say, stop my body. And I'm like, no, 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 we're cleaning your teeth. He's like, private part. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite interesting what, how much they're taught. And he feels really insulted when people force him to hug him. They're like, when, when his grandma can say, give mommy a hug, give grandma a hug. And he's like, stop my body. And she's like, but I'm your granddad, I mean, grandmom. And he's like, but this is my buddy. You know, so give children the tools to say stop. And Matteo asked me, but mom, what do I do? People feel, feel that I'm rude when I say stop if I don't want to hug them. And I tell him, well, what you can say is, no, I don't hug you because I don't know you, but I can do high five. So we need to give children sentences so they feel comfortable and they can make other people feel comfortable. Um, and also, I have the talk about pornography. Can you imagine? He's almost seven years old. So due to the statistics, in one, years old, in, in one year, he will be exposed to pornography from a friend who has a phone or whatever or, or will show him. How many of you have seen pornography sometime? Yeah. 
And uh, pornography is not a really good place to be at because 90% of pornography is uh, violence against women. Violence against w women. And uh, if I could, if I had a daughter who was a teenager, she would probably think I'm totally embarrassing, but I would tell her if a guy or a girl tells you to uh, do whatever you don't like, uh, let's say anal sex, um, you can say, you know what, this is not a porn movie. Because what guys do, they will shame you and say, what's wrong, relax. And you're like, I'm not relaxed in porn movies. This is not one of them. So we need to give teenager sentences that they can say when they're confronted in situation when somebody is their brainwashed by the porn industry. So what did I tell Matteo, a seven-year-old, how do you talk to them about porn? First of all, don't say the word porn. He's too little. Describe a situation so we understand what it is if he would be confronted with it. So what I told him, Matteo, I need to talk to you. And he's like, what now? Do I have more private parts? And I'm like, no. No, it's not about that. I'm going to talk to you about something that you can be exposed to. There's this industry where adult people and sometimes younger children uh, touch each other's uh, private parts. And they do things to each other um, that you're supposed to do in private rooms. And, uh, and he's like, why do they do that? Well, most of them don't feel good. And this, I want to tell you, 90% of the people who are in porn industry has been sexually abused as children. Doesn't make you horny knowing that information, right? So they expose themselves to that because that's how they got, that's how we got appreciation. So we think, okay, that's how I know I'm good. So I should, I'm supposed to be in this situation. So I told Matteo, well, they're not feeling good. You can almost say that there's some kind of, you can call them slaves in a way. And I didn't say sex because I think he's too young to know that word. So he's like, so they're slaves touching their private parts in movies. That's awful, mom. And I'm like, yes, it's awful. What should I do if I see it? I'm like, I don't know. Well, first of all, tell your friends about them, about what I told you. And he's like, they're going to laugh at me. I'm not sure they are. They're going to be interested because they don't know. They just look at it and they become curious. Mom, I know what we should do. If I see one of those movies, I will go to you and we can call the police. And I'm like, that's a good idea. So what you should do is like build the information and make it suit a six-year-old, seven-year-old or whatever. Um, when it comes to pictures, talk to them about respecting others' integrity when it comes to taking picture. Always ask before you take a picture. And if somebody takes a picture of you naked, and Matteo's like, I'm going to kill him. I'm like, no. <laughs> You're going to call mommy, and we're going <laughs> to talk to the police. So um, if you were to talk to your children about integrity, please do. If you know a child, if you have a child, talk to them about their private parts. Nobody talked to me about my private parts. I had no idea. And a lot of grown-ups, they go, I don't want to talk to my, to my child about private parts. He's way too young. And then I go, well, that's what you think. There's only one problem with you thinking he's too young to be been taught bright, private parts. The problem is pedophiles don't think children are too young. So start talking. Okay? And the fourth thing is... I want all of you to be the reason for somebody to, to say thank you to you in the future. Imagine that you saved somebody, a child, just by going home tonight, talking to your kids, saying, you know what, these are your private parts. You don't have to do the kind of things that some guys uh, encourage you to do just because they've seen porn movies. Or some women encourage you to do just because they've seen porn movies. Um, and also, it's okay to say no. If you don't feel like hugging, you can high-five them. That's okay. And uh, I want to reach out and say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you who stand up for children. 
a lot of people don't want to talk about sexual abuse because they feel it's uncomfortable talking about these topics. And I agree, this moment that I have now is really uncomfortable, but I still do it because I know something that's even more uncomfortable and that's being sexually abused as a child. So we need to talk about it. Four things would have saved me when I was a kid. The first thing is somebody would have uh, said, I've been sexually abused. I wish I would have met a survivor who wasn't ashamed in the dark, who stood up in the light and said, I've been sexually abused and it was wrong. It's not my fault, it's the pedophile's fault. I wish we would have had integrity drills that a teacher would have stood up and said, these are your private parts and the fire exits. Uh, if you've been sexually abused, it's calling the police. The third thing is, I wish my mother would have taught me my private parts. She's a generation that thought that maybe she's too young, but she did everything she could to protect me. I wish I didn't have my dad. I wish I didn't have a dad who is a pedophile. So which parents you get is a lottery. Sometimes you win, sometimes you, you lose. And I did both. And the fourth and last thing is I wish to be a thank you for somebody out there who's been sexually abused. And if you are sitting here or out there listening to this and you've been sexually abused, I want to tell you a few things. The first thing is it's not your fault. The shame is not yours. It's the predators. And a lot of people force us, survivors of sexual abuse, to forgive our uh, the people who abused us. But you don't need to forgive your person who abused you. Your person who abused you need to go to hell. Thank you. <laughs>